socialism with Chinese characteristics, democracy with Chinese characteristics, and modernization with Chinese characteristics. It seems that every time we talk about China, it has to have some Chinese characteristics. But exactly what does this term mean? It may sound obscure, but for the Chinese, it's not obscure. At all. So to help us understand these concepts, I'm here joined by Professor Roland Boer from the School of Philosophy of Remy University of China, and we're in Wuyi Academy, the place where an ancient Chinese scholar helped shape the Chinese civilization. Roland, welcome to The Point, and let's discuss this thing that everybody or people hear so much about, but they don't really understand exactly what it is, which is the Chinese characteristics. We hear so often, what make up the Chinese characteristics? And if I would ask you to use three key words, what would you choose? Three words, concrete conditions and culture. Concrete conditions. That's and culture. Right. Three C's. True. Okay. Concrete. The first two are connected to each other and obviously culture is as well. Okay. Tell us a, a bit more. What, what's, what do you mean by concrete conditions? Well, when I, when I translate it normally, I don't actually use socialism with Chinese characteristics. Or I'll, I'll explain it by saying, well, that is socialism in light of China's practical realities, concrete conditions, mm. its history, mm. development. Uh, all those kinds of things, the economic stage that it's at. And this applies because these things influence the way in which, uh, you know, socialism or democracy or so on develops in a particular context. So that's what it means. It's that reality, the, the history, the culture, all those sorts of things. Would you bring uh, one element, a concrete example of the concrete conditions that you mentioned? I was, I was thinking actually of um, a very you know, concrete reality. In 1949, with the establishment of the new China, China was one of the poorest countries in the world. Yeah. By a long way. Uh, life expectancy was something like 35, 36. What does that concrete condition mean? Well, you need to focus on the basic realities of life. You can't sort of talk about all sorts of other things before you actually have those fundamental things in place. That's a very, very concrete everyday life economic position and you need to develop things in light of that context. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of concrete conditions I was referring to. Yeah, so if I may take, uh, take it further, because of that very um, poor, very, um, limit, very insufficient condition for life, when the Communist Party of China led the people to, through the revolution and established their, the Chinese system. There was a reason why this party catered to the needs of that particular Communist Party. Exactly. And the methods used then were the right ones, which was um, highly centralised planning, as far as that was possible for the economy, to try and get things moving. I've been, for example, to the the Shogun uh, industrial site in the west of Beijing where the Winter Olympics were held mm -hmm. uh, just recently. And it's very interesting to note that even though it dates from, I think, 1911 or 12, the blast furnace was restarted very soon after 1949. It was absolutely necessary, a small starting point to get going. But you needed to do things like a centrally planned economy and then move forward to collectivised agriculture for that initial phase. And it's called the first economic miracle, mm -hmm. uh, that initial phase. Uh, yeah. Those were the realities at that time. Yeah. And that's what needed to be done. Yeah. That's so, what needed to be done. So the, the Communist Party of China did the right thing according to that, uh, that concrete condition. That particular time. What about the cultural aspect? Because the third C is culture. That's what right. about the Chinese culture that made the Chinese people back then susceptible or can relate to the ideas that were introduced through Marxism, through the, the, the party of uh, communism? Well, I'm touching in on a, on a huge discussion in China uh, currently, and it's known sort of the term is the second integration, mm. and that is the integration of the basic principles of Marxism with 
uh, the best of, as I, how I translate it, traditional Chinese culture. Now, what does that mean um, in light of the, the cultural framework? On the one hand, this has always been underway, always been underway. There's a reason why Marxism took root. Yes. Very practical realities, but also some, some core values that had grown up over the millennia of civilization that resonated. Such as? Such as, such as, for example, appointing people on the basis of competence and merit. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a very crucial one, goes way back. Uh, another one, of course, is what uh, is known as, translated variously as benevolence or reciprocity or two-person mindedness. Ren. Ren. Yeah. Ren, yes, exactly. Um, another one that I think of, it, this one is, I must admit, a little bit more, if I may, philosophical. Um, it's bringing forth the new through the old. Bringing forth the new through the old. Mm -hmm. um, or making informed choices as to what to accept and what to take further. So in other words, it's a, a process of constant renewal, innovation, that's already built into the Chinese cultural assumption. It's not regressive, it doesn't go look back to the past, hang on to the past for the sake of the past, okay. but it uses the values of the past to develop in a new way. So in a way, because... That's some a principle I think is really important. Yeah. yeah. Well, some people may have the impression that the Chinese, because we're so old as a culture mm. and a living one, meaning it's never been interrupted, it, it has continuously existed for millennia. So maybe the tradition is so strong that we may be not so open for new ideas, uh, lest we, you know, be different. We, 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 we lost our traditional roots. But actually you're saying, in the Chinese culture, there is an innate openness and ability to taking new things. How is that? Why is it that such an old civilization is actually quite agile mm. inside and, and flexible? Flexible, but also uh, there, there is a, a what is, how do I put it? There's a willingness to innovate, to tackle difficult new problems and find new ways to solve them. Mm. And I find this with my students. They want to really get into the, the tough problems and find new ways of thinking to deal with them. That is a notable feature of it. I also notice, for example, in surveys that are done amongst business leaders, say in Germany or Western Europe and China, whether they want to use new technologies, try them out. Mm. And from what I understand anyway, about 70% in China are willing to try new technologies to see what the possibilities are. If it doesn't work, well, we'll do something else. Yeah. There is that inbuilt process <laughs> of innovation of... What's the downside of it, though? Is there a downside? Well, every time I come back to China, it seems like so much has changed. Mm. Uh, whereas, you know, I go back to Australia or I go to Europe and people think things are moving along there, but nothing seems to change. Mm. Okay. So on the one hand, there's a kind of feeling of, well, I know what it's like, it doesn't change. Uh, and I ask people here, what, what is it like for things to change so much, to change so fast, especially in the last 40 years or yeah. 45 years, the reform and opening up? Uh, and one response is, well, uh, we're used to it. But on the other hand, there's always that question about where is your anchor? Where is the, you know, what is it that you can actually uh, hold on to? And I find very interesting the increasing emphasis of drawing out the best of China's traditional culture as providing a much wider and deeper foundation in light of all of those developments and changes. So there is a downside. It can leave you disoriented. It can, yeah. you know, you wonder where are we going with all of this and that sort of thing. So, yeah. you know, it's, I sometimes find it bewildering. I'm used to it, but still it can be bewildering. That's why we're in such a, um, fascinating and sometimes bewildering period of time when we have, you know, everything mm. within access mm. and there's a butterfly on your shoulder. <laughs> I don't want to drive it away because it's so beautiful. That's lovely. How yeah, often do we have a butterfly in the middle of my interviews? <laughs> I'm going to treasure this. Yeah. Um, and again, this is not how everyday China looks. If you go out on the street, you know, it looks like very right. much a Western city. So um, where are we going? I mean, and, and then hence the importance maybe 
to rediscover who we are mm. and to revitalize the 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 traditional roots of of us do you think that is the what's got, what's happening I, I see that happening in a sense it's been implicit but it's become very explicit in the process that's been taking place there's another important dimension of this though and you you find for example i've been uh, in may this year or last year i went to tibet mm -hmm. uh, and it's very notable that culture flourishes innovations both carrying forward the traditional culture, the best of it, but also innovations in culture in a new way, really takes place best on a strong economic foundation. And when you've got the resources to do so, you can all of these things can be fostered and encouraged and so on. Yeah. And China has that economic foundation now and it's able to do it at the same time. There's a recognition, I think, as the saying goes, where would China be today without 5,000 years of civilization? It wouldn't be China without yeah. that. So understanding it all the way from, if you like, before, you know, say from Confucius to today, understanding that history, understanding that culture, criticizing what's now outdated and shouldn't be taken forward, but drawing out what is valuable and taking it forward. That's really vital. How important is it, though, to understand this, to understand what makes the Chinese Chinese? Is it? How, Im how important is it, especially for people around the world this day and age? Because there is a great competition going on. There is hostilities, rivalry going on. And the constant, I would say, accusation of, you know, of, of the bad intentions of China or of the risk that China poses. And on the other hand, China says, we don't want, you know, to take over the world. We, what we want is, you know, a, a community of shared future for humankind, but people don't really relate to that idea, many. So why is it important to understand this? Mm -hmm. Well, one thing is quite clear, and it's been noticeable in the last five or ten years. Uh, China has stepped onto the centre of the world stage. And a small example of this for, in Australia. They used maybe to have, when the, the, the two sessions, the National People's Congress and the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference were taking place, they might have one little report on it. Yeah. This year, they were reporting on each day. Okay. Now, the representation, of course, you know what to expect. It's... it's negative, it's misinterpreted, all this rubber stamp stuff and so yeah. on and so forth. But the fact that they're paying attention to it is a recognition that the decisions made are not just important in China but have global, global implications. Mm. So it really is you know, at the centre of conversations, analysis, but also there's two sides to it and I always say to people that the West is actually a small number of countries in the world total population of the world about 12%. And what I find very interesting is that mostly, but not always, in Western countries, there, the world's changing, qualitative change is taking place, and they're very unsettled, yeah. very unsettled. They know things are changing. The world that they knew is past or passing. Yeah. Uh, there's a new world emerging. They don't understand it. Uh, but they need to understand it. So there's a tension, there's efforts to denigrate it. And of course, the other thing is, there's a, a good old saying, my parents were from the Netherlands. And there's a saying on, in, in the Netherlands, but also in Denmark, a thief always thinks everyone else is a thief. Okay. <laughs> I know, yeah, well, some people, right. wait, some people may be offended by that statement, right? <laughs> true, I, uh, yes, I know, but in what I'm trying to say, say yes, true, good point. What I'm trying to say is that um, the problem with the countries that, are, or the leadership of the media that is trying to misrepresent China or even fabricate lies about it, is that they assume that China is the same as they are. China would do the same. Would do the same, yeah. that's right, and yeah. seek whatever, world yeah. domination, yeah. hegemony, and so yeah. on and so forth. Yeah. And for those, either they understand but don't want to admit it, mm -hmm. or they simply don't understand that there's a different, mm. very different way of approaching en engagements with the world. Yeah. Uh, one example um, and, uh, is that some people talk about a new Cold War. Yes. But you need two to, to play the game. <laughs> Okay. And if you have one, 
who wants to foster a cold war, but the other side is simply not playing the game. You don't think China is... It's not playing the game. Why not? Why do you not think so? Well, in response, for example, to US sanctions, what does China do? It opens up further. And instead of engaging in block mentality, mm. the Belt and Road includes more and more uh, countries around the world in an inclusive approach to work with them. But you see the argument uh, among many in um, the, the Western countries now is China is trying to build its sphere of influence so that it has many brothers and sisters and allies in disguise so that it will take over the world or the Chinese model may take over the world. And you don't think that is China's intention? Absolutely not. From the cultural perspective, um, why do you think it is? Or maybe the traditional culture has changed, you know, over the past 40 years with the onslaught of Western ideas, Western notions? That well, it could be, but I don't, I don't think that's the case. I, there's another factor that's actually very, very important here, and this resonates with many countries around the world, and it's China's experience during the century of humiliation, so from roughly the Opium Wars in, in the 1850s to 1949, um, is uh, semi-colonialism, invasion by imperialist powers, uh, and really ground into the dust. And so uh, the principle arose of mutual non-interference, or if you like, uh, the negative is not seeking hegemony, not seeking to dominate. Mm -hmm. And this is a fundamental principle when engaging with other countries. And which countries recognize that principle? Countries that have been colonized in the past by Western imperial powers, because mm -hmm. they have exactly the same approach. We don't want you to tell us what to do, and we won't tell you what you should do. And it's that experience where you find, and if you think about all the countries in the world that have been colonised, it's the majority. It's the majority. So in a sense, it's quite clear, and it's been emphasised right through and again recently by the Foreign Minister, mm. that China's relationship with developing countries or the Global South, if we want to use those terms, is always much closer because it comes out of a common experience, a common historical experience. To have been colonised, exactly. to have been near um, being dismembered at a, exactly. at a certain point. Yeah. Um, but do you think that China could change or China could have adopted some of the you know, um, other notions, for instance, this idea of um, doing business with everybody you know for a long time merchants or doing trade is very much looked down upon in chinese society but over the past you know um especially since china joined the world trade organization we have been the one knocking on doors mm. you know do you want to buy something so could there have been changes in the chinese uh, approach to this world and and i don't know um the change is perhaps not in terms of trying to dominate or take over in that respect. It's, it's simply not part of the, if you like, the Chinese cultural DNA, mm. as from my perspective. Mm -hmm. It's simply not there. Um, but what has changed is the need to develop mechanisms for engaging globally. As I said, China stepped onto the centre of the world stage. Every decision now made, every policy adopted, uh, is, has implications obviously for China, but also mm -hmm. has global implications. Yeah. And it's becoming used to that uh, process, which it was already an anticipation 40, 45 years ago, but it's really become a reality in the last decade or so. Uh, so that is the notable development, how to deal with that, how to engage in that in a productive way. And so you find all of these the policies uh, being put forward on a new forms of global governance, new form of human civilization, a shared future for humankind, one after another, the Global Security Initiative. These are with a global view. Our idea of how the world should be? Or... Oh, that's an interesting question. I see them more as putting forward proposals for people to consider and then consulting about them and developing That's precisely food. what some people are afraid of. They're saying, oh, China is big and, and stronger. Now it wants to reshape the world order. That's what some people are saying. Do you see it that way? Uh, 
what world order are we talking about? Are we talking about... They're, they're ostensibly talking about the world order that's been established after Second World War, right. you know, yeah. the US-led institutions, that's the right. United... And China also says that we want to have the United Nations at the core, you know, we, we respect the UN Charter and so on. We don't want to dis to throw up mm. out everything, the World Trade Organization, at least the institutions that China says we, we want to uphold it. So how do you reconcile the kind of visions that China has put forward, the, the three initiatives and the, mm. you know, community of shared future, and um, the, the, the existing after a world war, post World War II order? Mm. Well, there's two sides to this, it seems. One is that the existing organisations are obviously going to be reformed in light of the changing global situation. But on the other hand, you have a series of other organisations now, Belt and Road, Shanghai Cooperation Organisation and so on, which are providing st or structures that are getting more and more important, BRICS as well as part of it, structures that are by their very nature going to change the way in which the world operates. But this is not simply a desire of a country like China, it's a desire of countries like Russia, countries in Africa, etc. The so-called rules-based world order, as is pointed out, is actually what Washington tells you to do. Mm. And I notice very carefully that the Chinese statement of this is to follow international law. Rules-based world order is not according to international law. So it's actually upholding international law, but international law needs to be updated, reformed in light of what some call a multipolar world. Mm. Uh, and that is going to change. And to be perfectly honest with you, I'm very optimistic. I think it's great that it is a time of qualitative change and that the world order we've had is changing. I think that's for the better. There's risks, but it's also immense opportunities. Yeah. Uh, in the end, if China does become a modernized country um, with Chinese characteristics, coming back to that term, yeah. um, how long do you think that's going to take? <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, what kind of world are we going to see? 2049. 2049? <laughs> okay, so we well, have 20, 25 years? It's the, obviously, it's, that's the, the century uh, since the founding of You the think China. it's doable? You think it's possible? In some respects, it's, things have already happened, but in another respect, it seems to me that China has only just begun. Um, or maybe I'll put it another way, because that can sound ominous to some listeners, if mm. I put it that way. What I find the situation is, if, no matter how something good is, or seems to be, they don't really sit back and say, oh, okay, it's achieved, don't need to do anything more. It can always be improved in some way, and it has to be, because conditions change. Yeah. Uh, that's a reality. I, it's, I find more and more uh, students from many different countries want to come to China to study to find out what makes China tick. Yeah. What makes China tick because this is a reality of the world today, but it's also a reality that China is on the world stage with other countries on the world stage. It's not the hegemon, to use that old term from you know, the warring states period and so on. That's the big difference. Fascinating. We have to be patient. Yeah. We do have to be patient. Yes, we do have to be patient. And meanwhile, work, do what we have to do to make this world a more equal place. <laughs> be patient. I think the West will come around eventually. Yeah, I, I'm not anti-West. You know, no, people people either. people would say, "Ah, oh, she's anti-West. She's no. anti-West." I'm not because I'm taking a lot from the West. That's you know, right. I, I study Western literature. I'm a fan of Western literature. Mm. I speak Western languages. Uh, my family is also, you know, to a big part Western. Mm. I enjoy Western music. I would take Western food, and I think the world will be much better if we are able to take in the best from exactly. every culture and peacefully coexist. Thank you so much, Roland, for sharing with us your thoughts and insights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Roland Boa, professor from the School of Philosophy at Remy University of China.